right, it looks like quite a few people have come. We might start right now. So welcome to the second academic seminar. We encourage you to turn on your cameras and ask questions in the Slido. Um, we're using the Slido to make it easier for you guys to ask questions and upload guest questions. I put the link in the Zoom chat. Um, just a reminder that iBuild mentoring application is due tomorrow at 9 p.m. And for more details, check out the link in the chat. Uh, today, we are here with Professor Tim Wilkinson, who will be giving a presentation on learning from disasters. He studied engineering at the University of Sydney. When he finished his studies, he really didn't know what he wanted to do. So he kept the part-time job he had at a department store um, for another year before taking his first engineering job with Australia Australian Institute of Steel Construction. Two of his old professors persuaded him to return to the university where he did his PhD in, in the field of tubular structures. A week before finishing his PhD, there was a sudden staff vacancy to lecture in structural steel structures in only a few days time. Tim was then made a temporary lecture and the rest is history. Um, from an academic perspective, Tim is proud that last year he became the first staff member in engineering promoted to the rank of professor based primarily on educational achievements. Tim has been a longtime advocate of social equity of access to engineering education through the creation and application of admission schemes and support mechanisms for students. But what gives, gives Tim the greatest satisfaction is he is well known by his many graduates as the most passionate, passionate teacher. Um, I'll head, hand it over to Tim now. There you go. Uh, thank you, Sangeetha, for the introduction. Can I just check, um, is the screen sharing properly and you can coming through? Can I get a thumbs up maybe from Robert yep. or Sangeetha? Everything's coming through great. Okay, okay, uh, fantastic. Well, look, good evening, everyone. It's it's so pleasing to, to see 216 people here uh, so far. Certainly more than I get in one of my lectures these days. I'm trying to think was, when was the last time I had a lecture room with 216 people in there, uh, certainly some time um, ago. So look, I'm a fantastic initiative here by, by SUS to, to try and um, increase the links between the staff and, and the students. Uh, so I, I hope that today's presentation about engineering failures is something that's going to be potentially uh, useful uh, and inspirational for you. So I remember when I was growing up, the very first disaster that I have any recollection of was, was the Granville train disaster. This was back in 1977, so this is probably telling you a little bit about how old uh, I am. And the 609 train from Mount Victoria um, coming into Sydney uh, and at 10 past eight in the morning, uh, around about Granville Station, the electric lo locomotive derailed, hit the support mechanisms of the Bolt Street Bridge and brought down this heavy, concrete slab on, on top of some of the passenger carriages. 83 people died. It still is the worst train disaster in, in Australia's history. Now that was 1977. And I want to fast forward a few years to 2003. We had the waterfall train crash. For some reason, uh, the driver of this train uh, had the train going way too fast. And as it uh, went round a corner, uh, round about Waterfall Station, left the tracks, went on its side, seven people were dead. Now, Granville was 1977, Waterfall 2003. That's 26, uh, that's 26 years, almost 30. Now, why is 30 significant in engineering disasters? There's a term that there's sort of a saying that we have in engineering about the 30 year failure cycle. And 30 years represents the period of generational change in any type of professional office in an industry. Um, someone who might have seen a disaster learnt from the consequences, may have been 25 or 30 years old. 
by the time 30 years rolls on, a new generation of engineers is in the office. And perhaps memory of what had happened, the lessons learned, sometimes disappears. And it's actually quite common that we see periods where a major engineering incident occurs. And it really happens, quite honestly, roughly um, every 30 years. And it goes back to a, a very famous quote, which is sometimes attributed to George Santayana, but, but not always, about making sure we remember the lessons of the past. So going back through time, probably one of the most error-prone engineering instructions was the bridge um, in Quebec, because it failed twice. Uh, after it was first opened in 1907, uh, the central span collapsed. And then when they were rebuilding the, the replacement bridge, um, 10 years later, not 30 years later, it too collapsed. But the collapse of the Quebec Bridge in Canada is legendary amongst Canadian engineers. And there is a saying um, or a myth that um, about uh, for all young Canadian engineers. When Canadian, when Canadian engineers graduate, they have what's known as the iron ring ceremony. All graduating engineers in Canada get an iron ring that go on the pinky finger of their writing hand. Legend has it that the, 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 the rings were made out of some of the beams that were taken out of the water from the, from the Quebec, from the Quebec um, Bridge. That's actually a little bit of a furphy. But the purpose of this, if you think about it, if you have a ring on this finger, every time you write, it is scratching across the surface. It provides a, a reminder, a memory um, to us as engineers about your responsibility, our responsibility when we're doing calculations and when we're signing things off. That the implications of one of our mistakes can mean the death of hundreds of people. We learn from our mistakes. Now, of course, probably the one of the oldest engineering disasters would be the Tower of, uh, of Babel. And many of you may have read about that in the Bible. The story goes that it was um, the, uh, the hubris of man trying to build a building that would reach to the sky um, and God punished all the workers and designers by making them all speak different tongues. The builders couldn't communicate with each other. And as a result, the Tower of Babel fell down. But what this actually emphasizes is the significance of good communication as part of engine, any engineering project. As we move into though more recent times, um, advancements in technology have brought along um, new problems. One of the most fascinating ones that happened in the 1950s was the de Havilland Comet. And I hope that some of you, particularly if you're an aeroplane buff, would have heard about this, this uh, particular uh, plane. Um, after World War II, and at the end of World War II, the, the air forces of the world were, were starting to create jet plane technology. And the de Havilland Comet was actually the world's first jet-powered um, passenger plane. But there were a number of completely unexplained disasters where this plane just fell from the sky. And it was eventually decommissioned, but no one knew what was going on. So some engineers were performing tests on these. They put the fuselage in, um, in a large, large container of water, emptied the water, filled the water, representing the compression and decompression. Um, that a plane would feel at takeoff um, and, uh, and landing. And what they actually found after doing several of these iterations of filling the water and unfilling it, representing the plane taking off on, on and off, the plane literally ripped itself apart, starting at one of the corners of the almost square windows. 
you'll probably know now when you look out the window of an aeroplane that those windows are quite rounded in the corners. Those sharp corners um, really revolutionise the thought of fatigue. There's high, what we call high stress concentrations around such corners. And it was, the, it was this uh, disaster of the de Havilland Comet that from which we learned um, so much about the tea cracks. If you've been in one of my classes, I think possibly, uh, uh, Sangeetha, there, can you mute people? I think there's one or two people yeah. in the audience who've got their sound on and this some feedback's coming through. Yep, I just muted them. Okay, great, thank you. Um, particularly for civil engineers, uh, and even in first year, the higher regency collapse is probably the most important case study that we can possibly know about because it was an error in the most simplest of statics that you learned in your very first semester um, with Lu Ming in civil 1802 that caused this, that caused this and the death of 114 um, people. The initial design of a set of walkways was meant to have a single steel bar sub, um, suspended from the ceiling, holding up three levels of bridge. Just by the simple free body diagram of the individual bolts holding up each layer, we can see that the load on each bolt was P. But a last minute change of design by the builder, not the engineer, um, who tried to simplify the erection process and put three separate bars with different bolts on each time, transferring the load actually meant that the top nut carried three times P rather than P. It was basically on the opening night of this hotel that this collapsed. You might think that in first year, some of the most basic things that you're doing, you think, oh gosh, um, this cannot possibly be important. The absolute fundamentals of statics and a free body diagram are just instrumental to understanding how things work. Most of the disasters in history though, have focused on loss of life. We are now seeing that the type of engineering disasters that we have, very often associated with um, the oil industry, can cause huge environmental um, damage. And so it's a, um, a, it is not just now us who are going to be structural engineers or civil engineers who want to be learning from the errors that we potentially make. So what are some of the causes of, of engineering disasters? Now, I'm not going to read these slides out um, for you, but I actually just want to run a, um, a quick little poll. So if you can just, all I want you to do is, you know, on the, um, you know, on your reactions on, um, on, on the screen, I just sort of want a yes or a no. Who's ever watched? Um, the aircraft disasters TV program that focuses on some type of plane crash and why it occurs. Who's, who's ever seen those? Who's watched those? Just, just a yes or a no. I mean, you know what button to click in the bottom of, uh, in the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay, I'm seeing a few thumbs up, a few ticks. That's good. That's good. What always strikes me when I watch that particular program is the fact that it's, it's hardly ever one thing that caused the plane to crash. It is generally a combination of two issues, three issues. The fail, you know, there was an error, but then the fail safe didn't work. It's generally two or three things combined that will cause a disaster um, to occur. Now, again, without um, spending, without spending um, too much time uh, on, on this, um, I just want you to reflect 
I'll leave the screen up there just for just for a few seconds to consider what has generally been uh, based on some analysis of the underlying causes of many engineering disasters. So how do we learn from these mistakes? How do we ensure that we learn from these mistakes? And in fact, it is actually getting harder to learn from our mistakes because these days, the minute there is any sort of engineering disaster, lawyers get involved, court cases get involved. Engineers are not necessarily wary of admitting an error or discussing things. It's just that so many of these cases now, um, once settled in court, the records are sealed, the real reasons behind why something happened. Yes, someone made a mistake, but how do we, how do we learn um, from it? So one of the things I was most pleased to, to, to read was this particular article about uh, uh, the Katrina uh, hurricane in New Orleans. Now it's funny, that was basically, um, I think there was another hurricane hit New Orleans almost to the day, uh, only in the last couple of days. But it was about admitting, settling a court case did not necessarily mean an admission of guilt, an admission of failure. And the more that we are open about why things happen, the more that we actually read about why disasters happen um, and learn from them, that is better, that is best for all of us in our civil engineering profession. I'm sure some of you have probably seen you know, what's happened in a number of residential buildings around Sydney in the last couple of years. Opal Tower out at Homebush and more recently um, Mascot Towers. Increasingly, we are seeing um, the human cost of not something falling down, but when something becomes useless or unsafe and what the implications are. I've been following the, you know, these particular stories in the news and you see the residents, you see the owners of the shops, their life savings you know, are, are gone, are shattered. They've spent a million dollars on an apartment in one of these structures and basically now um, it is worthless. They've had to live out of, a, out of a suitcase for the last one year, um, two years. Other implications for the construction industry is a very significant lack of confidence in buying new apartments. And I think that if you are a follower of the property market, particularly in Sydney, um, new residential high-rise buildings have been a little bit you know, unpopular in the last couple of years because of some of these failings that, that have occurred. I remember a few years ago waking up, turning on the news and seeing images of the Grenfell um, fire. Absolutely harrowing, uh, reading and watching um, 72 people lose their lives inside um, this building. Now, the implications of the Grenfell, tire, uh, Grenfell fire um, have been felt absolutely worldwide. For many years, we have all been starting to use cheaper um, claddings on the outside of our buildings, which Grenfell Tower you know, really showed um, were very dangerous. There are so many structures around Australia which are now being retrofitted at the cost of millions of dollars um, to remove this particular um, safety risk. It's our responsibility to be making sure that we are up to date on what materials are, um, are safe and not being afraid to question things. I've spoken a lot about mistakes. And I love this quote that came from the famous physicist Niels Bohr about how do you become an expert? And you become an expert by making mistakes. 
if you haven't pushed the boundaries, if you haven't done the wrong thing, if you haven't pressed the wrong button, if you've misplaced something on the calculator and you haven't learned from it, you probably are not yet um, an expert. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. I know I'll, I'll regress into lecture mode. For those of you who've done steel structures with me or doing steel structures with me, one of the things I always say about our assignments is if you make a mistake in your assignment, how many people are going to die? Well, the answer is no. It's an assignment. We're not going to use um, your design. Don't be afraid to make a decision, right? particularly in an assignment. If it's the wrong decision, who cares? Right? Be prepared to make a mistake. Back in 1968, one Sunday morning, the resident of the bottom story of the Ronan Point apartment buildings in, in London turned on her gas stove to make a cup of tea. And that gas stove exploded. That explosion was small and it blew out the, uh, the veranda area, the patio area um, of her apartment on the ground floor. But the entire corner of the building pancaked down because of that. This coined um, a phrase called disproportionate collapse and also another phrase called structural robustness. It was a design philosophy that became quite popular amongst engineers just after 1968. But that concept sort of lost a little bit of, of interest and importance until just over 30 years um, later. So we're halfway through this, this seminar. I just want to have a, a little break for 30 seconds, have a little drink. Why don't you too for a second? Um, this would be a great time if you have any questions to put them in the Slido um, or just look at the questions and I'll put any if you have any questions. Okay. Okay. Um, a little bit of change of direction. First half of this presentation, I've been speaking a lot in, in generalities about a whole variety of engineering disasters. Um, in the second half, I, I want to talk about one in particular. So we think 1968 and add pretty close to 30 years uh, to 1968, which brings us to 2001. probably the most significant engineering disaster event of my generation was 9-11 and the collapse of the of the world trade the world trade center not only did that have massive influence on um, engineering it had a massive influence in the world and we are still seeing um, the remnants of what occurred 20 years ago. What has just happened in Afghanistan? Only yesterday, the last American troops uh, flew out of uh, Hamid Kazai Airport. They entered um, Afghanistan 20 years ago as a response to the World Trade Center. Now, that was 20 years ago. And, and what is actually incredible, so many of you might, have, might not have even been alive. Uh, back in 2001. So if you're still a teenager, 18 or 19, so in first year or second year, um, you were even born then. And then for, even if you were in third and fourth year, I'm not sure if you would have a good memory from when you were one or two years old. But um, it happened at about 10 o'clock Australian, 10 p.m. Australian time. Um, and I'd actually gone to bed. 
And um, my brother had been watching TV. He came into my bedroom and he, and, you know, he said, Tim, wake up. Um, two planes have just crashed into the World Trade Centre. And I said to myself, how the, you know, would that, would that, um, could that possibly happen? How can an accident like that happen? You know, I ran into the lounge room and turned on the TV. And within a few seconds, you realised this was not, um, this was not an accident. Um, so next morning, I went to work, um, ran into to, um, one of the professors, and we started talking about what had happened um, the night before. And he pulled out a book about uh, skyscrapers. We looked at the design of the World Trade Center and we sort of went, I reckon this is what happened. I reckon this is why it fell down. Um, and within an hour, I put up a website about why did the World Trade Center um, collapse? And this is less than 12 hours after the whole thing had fell down. And that literally became the most visited website in the entire world um, for a period of about one week after the collapse of the, um, of the World Trade Center. Anyway, um, enough about me. I want to tell you just a little bit of story um, about the design of this building and what happened and what we can potentially learn from it. Um, for those of you who, who, are, who are history buffs, um, the island of Manhattan uh, actually, the, the city used to be called New Amsterdam because it had first been colonised um, by, by the Dutch. Um, Manhattan is not the same size as it was in the 1960s. There's been gradual expansion of the docks, um, the wharf areas of the southern tip of, of Manhattan. And the sort of the little red square there in the middle of the screen is actually the representation of where the World Trade Centers used to, used to sit. Um, you can see that back in 1700s, that was actually uh, in, the, in the Hudson River. Um, so uh, a lot of change, a lot of development in New York over, over 300 years. So the site is actually in what used to be the river. Um, the, uh, the architects of the World Trade Center was uh, Minoru Yamasaki, uh, and it was engineered by um, a gentleman called Leslie Robinson. And that, that's a photo of them there, you know, planning, planning the structure. The way the structure was first built was what is called the bathtub. Because this was uh, inside basically where the river used to be, there is you know, a massive set of, um, of retaining walls to keep the river out. You'll see that big red structure that seems to be going through the, mid the middle of, of the building site. Um, that was actually the, uh, the new, that's the New York subway. Um, the subway had been in that site before it was built. And when they were excavating, they had to build around the existing subway tunnel, um, dig underneath it, prop it up. Um, sadly, that subway uh, has sort of gone since the disaster um, occurred. There was a very um, special and unique construction uh, related to the World Trade Center, which I'll, I'll um, talk about in, in a second. But the real architectural um, strength, brutality of, of this structure was this series of very closely placed um, steel columns all around um, the, the, out, the outside um, of the structure. It was built in these sort of panels. Now, probably the most significant thing initially that prevented um, high-rise buildings being built was the lifts. Um, the number of lifts that you would need to cater for the number of people in a 100 story building um, would mean you would need so many lifts that you actually would have no building left. The World Trade Center actually was the, the, the debut of a really special and unique mindset about a combination of express lifts and local lifts. 
Um, if you wanted, to, and, and you had, would have to catch two leads. There were a number of transfer lobbies. There were three of them. You know, basically fiftieth, you know, thirtieth floor, sixtieth floor, ninetieth floor. And if you wanted to go say to the fortieth floor, you would catch the express lift to the thirtieth floor, and then the local lift from the thirtieth floor to the fortieth floor. Having two sets of two sets of lifts with the local lifts, the three sets of them actually running through the same lift shaft, but only a third of the way up the building, enabled them to minimise the floor space allocated to elevators and enabled them to come up with an economical uh, design. Probably one of the most striking things about the construction were these panels of three external columns um, built together. Very, very narrow um, window spacing uh, was, was, was allowed. Now, when you design um, a high-rise building, Probably the most important design criterion is wind. It's not gravity. And um, coming up, so it's a gigantic cantilever. I'm sure some of you would remember from structural mechanics, the foam beam, and, and I've said, what is, a, what is a high rise building? I said a high rise building is just one tall um, vertical, uh, vertical cantilever. Um, the mechanism of this building with those very substantial steel columns on the outside enable them to hold the tension and compression when this whole structure bends and sways in either wind load or earthquake load. So what happened on 9-11? Now, firstly, the World Trade Center was designed for um, an aircraft collision. Um, back in the early 1930s, when the, when the Empire State Building had been constructed, um, a number of planes actually hit that. Um, now, they were tiny little propeller planes. But the World Trade Centre was designed um, for plane impact, but a completely different scenario than, than what occurred. The design scenario that had been considered for the World Trade Centre was a low-flying plane coming in from Los Angeles, looking to land at LaGuardia um, Airport. Empty fuel, because just flown over from Los Angeles, about to land, fog, basically flying as slow as it possibly can. It certainly was not designed for a 767 with a full fuel load flying um, at, um, at full speed. Now, as we know, when the planes hit, the buildings did not fall down, but it left a massive hole in the side of one of the buildings and ignited um, an immediate and massive fire. Um, the, uh, the, the, the first picture represents the size of the type of plane that had first hit. Um, the um, the World Trade, sorry, the, the Empire State Building back in the 19, back in the 1930s. Um, the planes that hit the World Trade Center of the second picture um, are 767. But basically the impact of that um, would have completely sliced through the core structure um, of the building. So let's discuss what happened um, on, um, on impact. Um, we hope we've all seen pictures um, a, bit, a bit like this. Um, approximately one third of the columns were immediately set, immediately destroyed. But um, the other columns, they were, still they were still fine and could easily pick up the extra load that, you know, the extra two thirds, sorry, extra one third load that they had to hold. It's just a computer simulation. I don't need to talk um, talk too much about uh, not talk too much about that. Um, the load was able to be transferred over to to the remaining columns. The building did not fall down. There was sufficient structural redundancy in in the structure. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about structural redundancy. Again, I'll talk about structural mechanics. We did bending moment diagrams. We did bending moment diagrams by statics, a statically determinant structure. Um, statically determinant structures are no good. The minute 
one breaks, the whole building falls down. We need to build redundant structures, which is what the World Trade Center was. A third of the columns could be destroyed and yet it would still stand up. But it was the fire. Now the fire had a number of um, influences and no one really designed this building for an aircraft um, explosion. The type of fire that they had anticipated was um, an office fire. Um, two things were quite different about the airplane, uh, the airplane fuel fire um, versus a typical office fire. Number one, many of the what's called the risers, so risers are the, the water pipes that would bring the would, would, would bring the fire extinguishing water up and down the building they were immediately severed by the impact. And that basically prevented um, any sort of fire um, sprinklers um, going off. Number two, um, it's very common to have um, uh, material on steel columns and steel beams, which stop them from heating up too quickly. We'll talk about that in a second. But the explosion of the fire actually blew up I'm sorry, blew off um, the vermiculite coating on many of the steel beams and, and, and columns, which made them very susceptible to weakening under fire extremely quickly. And the third thing, which was completely different, is an immediate massive sudden fire was created rather than a small fire starting in a corner rubbish bin, paper bin, which someone threw their cigarette into because, of course, Back in the 1970s, when this building was designed, people would still be smoking um, in there. Um, maybe thinking of materials, and I know that your materials lecturer, um, at least one of your materials lecturers, is, has, is here in the audience. So um, we'll be br bringing up a smile seeing these graphs. The impact of heat on steel has two issues. After about an hour at fire-like temperatures, the yield stress of steel um, generally uh, reduces by a half and the elastic modulus of steel generally reduces by around about a half. So this is a graph of how Young's modulus changes um, uh, in, in a fire and a similar graph for, um, for yield stress. The floor system, that um, held up um, each, of the, each of the floors was, was what's called an open web steel joist, basically um, a, a, a truss. Now, the end connections of that were essentially designed for gravity loads, just pushing down. So on the, on the left-hand corner um, of, this, of, of the connection from the truss to the, the outside columns was essentially just designed for, for a vertical load. However, as the structure heated up and Young's modulus decreased, the structures, the, these trusses started to sag. And as they started to sag, they pulled, right? They created a horizontal force on, you know, on that connection between the truss and, and the outside columns. Those connections were not really designed for a horizontal component of the globe. And that's what actually caused the collapse. Um, I show this particular slide in both structure mechanics and, and steel structures, and um, I'm not going to go through that in great detail today. I want to talk a few, I just want to talk really briefly about some of the lessons learned after 9-11. Um, firstly, um, an investigation done by the Americans in, in FEMA uh, basically absolved engineers of all responsibility. There was no reasonable expectation that anyone could have possibly designed this structure not to have fallen down based on the information and technology that they had available to them in the, 19, um, in the 1970s when this structure was, was first designed and built. But there were a couple of key recommendations um, about this theme of structural robustness, which I'll talk about into a second. 
the location of fire exits. One of the reasons why the people perished um, was that they were unable to get out you know, above the impact level that the fire exits were actually um, uh, cut, um, cut off. And about designing better and more blast resistant fire retardant material that we can spray on steel beams that would not get blown off um, if there was some type of um, explosion. This is reflected in many of the standards that we use um, that we use today. So I know if there's anyone here from my steel class that you have downloaded AS 1170.0. Lewis just gave me a thumbs up that he's designed it. He's used it, but I, I know Lewis that you haven't looked at section six, have you? No, um, uh, that's a no. Um, so what are some of the lessons that we learned from failure? Now, I need another quick drink. So I just want you, and I hate people reading out slides. So I want to let you read this one yourself. All right, now I've spoken about disasters. What about successes? The things that we have learned from engineering disasters over the years enable us to push the boundaries and create better and more exciting structures. So I actually want to run a little bit of a quiz, a little bit of, of, of a competition. And I'm about to put up a couple of slides to end this presentation. And I'm after the first person who can put in the chat their answer to what this structure is. What is this structure um, called? And where is it? The first person. Um, I don't think Vic, uh, um, Sangeetha and Victor, uh, you don't know this, but you have to find a prize um, to give to the first person who can give uh, give a correct answer. Um, is that going to be problematic for, for you two? I'm sure we but can think of something. I'm sure you can think of something good. All right. So, um, this is me, so it's not going to be an easy question. All right, so a couple of pictures are going to come up. Which building is this? Where is it? Now I have got a series of I have got a series of pictures which which make it a little less difficult. I won't say it makes it easy. It makes it a little bit less difficult. We've had a few answers in there. Um, they haven't appeared. The correct answer hasn't appeared yet. Same building.
some, yeah, I love the, the, there's a great answer there um, somewhere. Now, um, I probably can't fault that answer, can, uh, can I? Um, that's a pretty perfect answer. I'm just going to, uh, there'll be one more help. Um, I'll, I'm going to leave it up. To, I'm going to bring up one more picture just, just in, a, in a second. Like hard oval. Okay, we do have a winner. So John Yang. Um, well done. The Haida Alia Centre. It's in Baku, uh, Azerbaijan. Um, and I think a couple of people have also got the um, got the correct architect there, um, uh, Hadid. I thought this was an absolutely incredible building. But what I really love about it the most is actually this: the initial sketch, the initial, um, the initial concept. And I know that many of you will probably, you know, one of the things I often say about what's important is paper and a pen. That's where all great engineering ideas. Um, Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, I think it's question time. We've got a few questions in the Slido. Um, one of the most popular questions was, um, what is the main takeaway from these disasters for us as graduate engineers entering the workforce? And I just came on one second. Can you, Sangeeta? Just look, learn from mistakes and not just your own mistakes, but learn from um, the mistakes of others. Um, engineering mistakes occur all the time. I know I said they happen every 30 years. I probably, you just have to give me a little bit of uh, uh, leeway on, on that one. The more that you... Um, read about, research, talk to other people about mistakes they have made, why they made them and what they learned from them, um, the absolute better. Right? So find out about them and what were the causes and then make sure that you don't repeat them. Yeah, that sounds like valuable advice. Um, another question was for data analysis of ethical slash moral morally heavy incidents. How would how will you um, how will the emotive slash moral elements affect the criteria of data gathered and findings? That's a lot. Is is that in Slido? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm just sort of going through because uh, I didn't catch all of what it was. Uh, what was it? Ah, for data. Gosh. I've highlighted the questions. Oh, at gosh. The top. How? That's a, that's a, for data analysis of that. How will you motive more? Uh, look, you've stumped, you've stumped me on that one. I, um, I, I haven't got an immediate answer to that one. I'm sorry. That's a great question. We can come back to it later, I guess. Um, so how do you stay positive um, and motivated with student engagement after having such a long career? Well, that would sort of assume that you think I'm still positive and motivated. Um, uh, Definitely. <laughs> uh, well, firstly, it's flattering if, if you still think that I'm that I'm I'm positive I'm I'm positive and, and, and motivated. I look I, just a, just a couple of things about I'll say what gets me up in the morning and what, what excites me. Uh, I've got an older brother, and he he has a very similar job to me. He teaches structural engineering at UTS, or he used to. He's he's actually now retired. Um, 
So for a period of about 20 years, <clears throat> he, he also taught steel structures. Both he and I could say that like our family were responsible for educating half of all of the civil engineers who graduated in across Sydney. And that basically meant that almost every building, every project somehow had um, the Wilkinson influence um, uh, uh, on it. And, you know, even though you'll go on to do bigger and greater things, I hope that, um, um, you know, what I do as a lecturer puts you on, puts you on the right, right way. Um, as in how to stay motivated look i've been teaching the same course for 20 years and people actually some people say oh gosh you shouldn't teach the same course 20 years you'll become stale or whatever i must say i personally don't um even though oiler buckling is still pi squared ei on l squared and wl squared on eight is still exactly the same thing that um i taught 20 years ago um i hope that I'm continually changing, updating, refining the way I teach things to what I hope explain things better and better, reflecting the changing um, technology and um, experiences that, you know, the students have, the students that I've got today, um, even though there's a lot of similarities, there's a lot of differences to, to, to the group I taught 20 years ago, which requires me to sort of stay on, on my toes. Yeah, um, I think I'll share the screen so that everyone can see the questions. Um, so can you see the screen? Okay. Um, so... Next question was, how has technology and structural engineering advanced since you've joined the industry and what direction is it heading? Um, look, certainly um, com compute computerization um, has, 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 massively, has massively changed things. Um, I'll go back before I, I actually joined the profession. I, I remember that I did um, my, my year 10 work experience as, as an engineer. And I was doing structural analysis back then. Now they did have computers um, back then, uh, but the, the mathematical power behind them was, um, was, 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 was minuscule. Now, Who's done in, in maths, in, 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 in vector maths or whatever, did you ever do a concept called diagonalization? Yeah. Lewis is, 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 is nodding, so that means you must have. Um, when, when we do a structural analysis, basically the computer um, inverts a, um, a matrix, a two by two matrix, a three by three matrix, a 100 by, by, um, by 100. Um, matrix. Um, I remember that the, the 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 things that the programs that I was using back then, that was back in 1985, had a limit, and it was basically a, um, uh, a it was almost like a 20 by 20 limit. Um, for those of you in steel structures, I'll, I'll talk to you a tiny bit about this in a few weeks. But you had to make sure that the no numbers of your stru of your structure. Um, didn't differ by more than about 20. Otherwise, the computer couldn't solve the problem because it didn't have a diagonalization um, algorithm um, built, built into it. Um, nowadays, we can analyze 1 million by 1 million degrees of freedom in any type of structure in the, um, in the, the blink of an eye. So it's the fact that um, so much computing power is available, but it's come at a little bit of a cost. And it has come at a little bit of a cost of a slight loss of a feel for how the structure behaves. Um, and that's why, you know, I've always got this with me. All right. 
um, there was a question in the Zoom chat from Victor. Um, he said, so as opposed to ordinary systems that can expect fire extinguishing or external mitigating methods, a high rise like WTC has expected that mitigating these methods might cut off and result, resort simply to brutally reinforcing the structure's capacity themselves. Um, there's very, to, to be um, blast resistant is almost impossible. Uh, there is still, there is basically no defence against a flying missile of a 767. The most effective way to protect a building from an aircraft flying in it is making sure that aircrafts don't get hijacked. But that is actually the, um, the, 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 the simple answer. But there's other forms of explosion and impact over which we can um, protect buildings from. And again, and it's actually not from brutal reinforcement, it comes from horizontal separation. Um, when there's a blast, the energy um, expands with, a, with, a, with an R cube. So every, so it's all about providing a separation between the structure and where any explosion might, might occur. So in fact, um, terrorist effective design of structures is, is all about minimising the opportunity for you know, a car bomb uh, to get close to the structure. And I mean, that's why you see all these concrete bollards around buildings about it's very important. Uh, no, 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 Thank you. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yep. I can hear you. Okay. Um, no, I just, I just want to ask, so in, ho hopefully it never happens, but in the event that such a thing happens again, though, do we, so according to the, uh, in, I think in AS3600, which it deals with um, fire safety, uh, the design philosophy behind the fire safety code is that they're essentially designing the thickness of the concrete slab with the expectation it will fail, but how long it will fail. So like it might be one hour, it might be two hours, it might be something like that. Yeah. Has that, is that the, the core like philosophy now of the standards or is there, does, does, does say, for, say for instance, like a WTC, do they still expect some kind of external methods to, re, uh, to reduce the heat and to still maintain structural integrity? Because otherwise you can't reduce the heat you can only say, let's try to make sure in one hour we can evacuate everyone. It, it's, a, it's a combination of, um, of things. Um, actually, one of the biggest causes of fatalities in fires is smoke inhalation. Um, even before the building, even before the building falls down. So in fact, a key um, element of design is what's called compartmentalization. So that if a fire does occur, that effectively that would be blocked off um, from a ventilation perspective um, so that the smoke doesn't get to other parts of the structure and basically kill people from um, you know, smoke inhalation. Or the other thing related to smoke inhalation about smoke is it reduces visibility and um, that greatly reduces your speed if you're going down the fire um, exit. If you, go, if you go down a fire exit, when it's clear and the lights are on, you can go pretty far, pretty fast. When you're going down a fire um, exit and there's lots of other people and you can't see anything because it's sick with smoke, your rate of evacuation is much, much lower. Um, so the evacuation ability is um, probably the, the, the key thing these days. Okay. Um, so it looks like it's almost time um but we have the question from the start that if you have any answers to it so for data analysis of ethical and morally heavy incidents such as 9 11 um how will the motive slash moral elements affect the criteria of data gathered and findings i still don't have an answer to that one <laughs> okay <laughs> it's all good um we could maybe 
if you do come up with an answer, you can like email us and we could pass it on to everyone later. No, I actually think because I'd like you guys to give me your answers. And I'm going to tell Anthony Katie that no pep hours unless you answer that question in your uh, claim form. How's that? How's will that go down well? Do you think? That'll be pretty brutal. Actually, I think you could just say in the claim form, "What was the one question Wilco refused to answer?" <laughs> that, that, that'll that'll see if people are paying attention. Yeah. But does anyone have an answer? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have one. Let's be honest, if they can answer, they probably don't have to be sitting around here anymore. I mean, educated guess is also welcome. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like no one quite knows. Um, so thank you, Professor Tim Wilkinson, for doing this talk and this presentation. Um, Really appreciate that you took time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, also check out the iBuild mentoring program application, which is due tomorrow at 9 p.m. Um, thank you all for coming and yeah. Thanks, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate you coming on. It's a pleasure for us. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's good to see you.